Thanks, Pastor Wee Long. Good morning, church. Good morning, everyone there in Suntech. And if Suntech, if you want to wish me a good morning, please wave your hands. Okay, great. I, can, I can't hear you. I can see you. Um, well, don't worry. There's no pressure. I'm never pressured to come up here and preach. Only full of pleasure to be bringing the Word of God to all of us. And it's great to see this place really packed out. I know last night was a bit empty. I know because we're ending Chinese New Year. So last night, a lot of people were having their you know, final go at you know, doing their low hay, trying to get as much food on the table and on the roof as possible. Uh, but now that that's all over today, we're here in the house of the Lord. And I'm very excited to be here. And like I mentioned last week, you know, we are going to be starting a brand new sermon series. And so today we're starting with that. And I want to tell us that this sermon series is entitled, Come, Follow Jesus. Come, Follow Jesus. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but a couple of years ago, I think it was 2013 and into 2014, we had another sermon series at the time. It was called, Come, Meet Jesus. I don't know if you guys remember that. And we went through the entire Gospel of Mark. And the reason I want to have this sermon series this year, I feel it's sort of like a, a continuation from that series. And so over the next couple of weeks, we'll be talking uh, what it means to follow Jesus and how we should live our lives to demonstrate that we are followers of Jesus Christ. And during the course of the original sermon series, we talked about meeting Jesus, and we, we learned a lot about what Jesus did. We studied the book of Mark, we, we, we learned a lot about his life, and if anything, the aim of that series was for us to meet Jesus, to know who he is. And that's great. It's, we should meet Jesus, we should know who Jesus is, but I think it's not enough. It's not enough just to meet Jesus. And as I start this sermon series today, I want to share with us this, this one sentiment that I have. And this one sentiment is this. Many people meet Jesus, but few follow Him. Many people meet Jesus, but few actually follow Him. There is a big difference. There is a monumental difference between meeting Jesus and following Jesus. Now, I'm going to quote my old man for a bit. I'm going to quote my dad. Some of you, you may, if you've been in FCBC for a long time, you would have heard this before. It's my first time using it in a sermon, so it's a bit special. But those of us who are old school FCBC people, you would have heard this before. And when it comes to following Jesus and meeting Jesus, I want to say this. There is a heaven and an earth difference, an east and a west difference between, not a cell church and a church itself, huh? but between meeting Jesus and following Jesus. That's how big a difference there is. There's a monumental difference between meeting Jesus and following Jesus. And that's what I'm going to talk about this weekend. As we start off this sermon series, the sermon I have for us this weekend is the same title, Come, Follow Jesus. Because today I want to tell us the importance of following Jesus. I want to share with us what it means and what does it take to follow Jesus. So as we come to this point, why don't we take out our Bibles, let's turn to Scripture, and let's see what the Word of God has in store for us. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 20. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 20. And it says this here, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and they followed Jesus. Why don't we come and join our hearts together and let's commit this time into the Lord's hands. Lord, we thank you that we can gather together as a family. We can gather together across two different centers, but still have one heart and one spirit. Lord, we ask for your presence to come and be here this morning. Open our hearts, open our, our, our eyes to see the things that you're revealing to us. Open our ears that we will hear your words being spoken to each and every one of us. And we ask that our hearts will be softened, that we'll leave this place having been transformed and touched by you. So we commit this service into your hands. In Jesus' most mighty name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. So here we just read in Mark chapter 1, Jesus calling the first disciples. And when Jesus called the first disciples, notice what he says here. Jesus says what? Come, follow me. He didn't say, come, hang out with me. Come, check this out. Come, let's do something together. No, he says, come, follow me. And if you look at the original uh, Greek text, it uses a Greek word that literally means, come after me. Come along with me. If anything, literally, it means come, follow me. 
And for more, many of us in Singapore, I know we are educated in English. Our first language is English. Well, let's take a look at a dictionary. What does the word follow mean, all right? There, there are three key definitions I pulled up, okay? Number one, to follow means to move or travel behind. A second definition is this. It means to act according to. To act according to an instruction, a law, or a precept. The third one is this. It means to pay close attention to. So look at these three things. To follow someone means to literally move or travel behind. If, someone, if I'm literally following someone, it means I'm, I'm following that person, I'm walking behind that person. To act according to is, for, for example, uh, I, I follow the... I, I, um, I don't know, when I'm, when I'm driving, I follow the, the, the road laws, I follow the highway code. That is, means, you know, I act according to it. Or it could be to pay close attention to. We also follow, we, we have many celebrities we like to follow. We follow our favourite actor, we follow our favourite football club, we, fa we follow a lot of different things. That means to pay close attention to. And so if we take these definitions and we put it into what we just read about following Jesus, what does it mean? When Jesus called the disciples to follow him, well, of course, he was literally telling them, move and travel with me. Move behind me, travel with me, follow me. He was also asking them to obey what he teaches, to commit themselves, to follow whatever he teaches, to do whatever he calls them to do. And of course, the last one he means is that as you follow me, take an active interest in what I'm doing. Take an active interest in what I'm saying. Just like how we take an active interest in our celebrities, in our sports clubs. Take an active interest in the teaching of Jesus Christ and in the way He is living His life. You see, to follow Jesus involves us becoming more and more like Jesus. It involves us truly becoming just like Jesus. And if we truly follow Jesus, it will be shown in our lives. We can tell whether someone is following Jesus or not. And that brings me back to the opening statement I made, that many people meet Jesus, but few follow Him. Many people meet Jesus, but few follow Him. Church, friends, this morning I want to tell us that it's not enough to just meet Jesus. It is not enough to just encounter Him. We need to follow Him all the days of our lives. And as we look at the Gospels, we will read about many situations, many encounters, many times where people met Jesus, but they chose not to follow Him. Who was, who was a group of people that were one of, one of Jesus' greatest adversaries? The Pharisees, right? The Pharisees met Jesus. They met Him on numerous occasions, but yet they never chose to follow Him. You see, that's what I'm getting at. It's one thing to meet Jesus, and it's another thing to follow Jesus. And sometimes that's what happens here in the church. Many of us, we want to come and meet Jesus, but we just leave it as that. Again, I'm not saying it's wrong to meet Jesus. I'm not saying it's bad. We all must meet Jesus, but we cannot leave it there. We need to meet Jesus, and then we're presented with a choice to follow or not to follow. And so today, the question is this, are you willing to follow Jesus? Are you willing to follow Jesus? And I'm sure if I ask us to raise our hands, everyone, we should raise our hands, you know, of course, I'm here, I want to follow Jesus. But before we really answer that, let's take a look at what it takes to follow Jesus. So today I want to share with you two things, two things that it takes in order for us to follow Jesus. What are these two things? Number one, in order for us to follow Jesus, it takes, firstly, commitment. It takes commitment. As we look at the definition of the word follow just now, whether it's to literally move behind somebody, whether it's to follow a set of instructions or precepts, whether it's, it's, to, it's to be interested in, all that takes commitment. It all requires commitment. That cannot be accomplished if we are not committed. And so when Jesus says to us, come, follow me, He's really asking ourselves to commit ourselves to Him, to commit ourselves to His ways, to commit ourselves to His teaching. That is what He's saying when He says, come, follow me. When we choose to follow Jesus, it is an act of commitment. Let's look again at Mark chapter 1, verses 17 to 20. What, is, what, what happens there? Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. At once, the disciples left their nets and they followed him. And when Jesus had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat. Without delay, he called them. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed Jesus. What do these two phrases here show us? These two phrases here shows us that these first disciples, they made a conscious decision. They had met Jesus, or Jesus had met them, but there was a choice. 
They could just stay as having people who had met Jesus or they could choose to become followers of Jesus and they chose to follow Jesus. They chose to commit themselves to Him. Let's make no mistake, church. Jesus has and always will be looking for disciples committed to following Him. In fact, through the Gospels, it's recorded over 20 times where Jesus has called people to follow Him. And I'm sure many of us remember this other key passage, this key scripture where Jesus asked us to follow him as his disciples. And it was our theme verse for, uh, for I think, for 2013 or 2012. It's Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Then Jesus said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Follow me. And listen to the words here. He says, they must deny themselves. They must take up their cross daily. They must follow me. What are these? These are statements that challenge our commitment. To deny ourselves is to, be, is to challenge our commitment. To carry our cross daily is a challenge of our commitment. Are we willing to do all that? And what's interesting is that actually whenever Jesus calls people to follow Him, He always makes it very clear that it is going to take commitment. It will take commitment to follow him. Let's look at this familiar passage, Luke chapter 9, verses 57 and 62. Same chapter, Luke 9, 57 and 62. As they were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But that man said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Let's be honest for a moment, guys. We look at a passage like that as Christians, as churchgoers, and very often we look at a passage like that and we kind of like to gloss over it. We feel a little uncomfortable when we look at it. We feel a little bit uneasy. You know, if you were in a traditional church where a lot of those churches like to stand up and everybody reads the, the passage together, you know, you know some, some verses well, we will read with a lot of gusto, you know, I don't know, you know for, the, for the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear and of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love and of sound mind. You know, we'll declare it together. But we read a passage like that and it's kind of like, oh, I don't understand. Uh, you deny yourself. You know, we kind of feel bad. We kind of feel uncomfortable when we raise some of these things. Why? Because if anything, this kind of is kind of controversial. It's kind of of of, of difficult. What what Jesus is saying right there. But I think a pastor by the name of Chuck Swindle he puts it the best way possible. He puts it perfectly. He says this more than once. Jesus deliberately addressed certain issues that quickly diminished the number of onlookers, and it was commitment that thinned the ranks. Jesus deliberately addressed issues that quickly diminished the people that are around, the number of onlookers. He was as a test of their commitment. And that's what happens here. Jesus was doing, he was, what he was doing, he was telling the people around him, hey, you're not here to meet me one-off. You're not here just to encounter me. You're here to follow me. Not just today, not just until dinner, not just until next month or next year, not until you get your first job, not until you get your first kid. No, you're here to follow me for the rest of your life. Can you handle that? Can you give that? Do you have what it takes? Do you have this commitment? That is what Jesus is saying right here. Well, the first disciples did. And if anything, we know the disciples were not perfect. But the disciples decided there and then to commit themselves to follow Jesus. Remember this. In, in, in Mark chapter 1, there's a very important part in that passage. It says this, that these people, these disciples, who were they? They were fishermen. And when Jesus said, come, follow me, what does the Bible record? It says that they immediately dropped their nets. They immediately left their nets and they followed Jesus. Think about it. What does this net represent? This is a, it's, it's very symbolic. It's very powerful symbolism here. What? is that net. These men are fishermen. That net to them is not just a net. I mean, to most of us, I say, hey, drop a net. Okay, I'll throw the net away. It doesn't, doesn't bother us. But these men are fishermen. 
To a fisherman, what does this net represent? It represents their livelihood. It represents their source of provision. It represents what they do. It represents who they are. You know, back then, it's not like, it's not like today, you know, where people are very educated and, you know, you come out with a, with a with, I don't know, a diploma, a degree, and you can kind of can kind of jump into different sectors, do different kinds of jobs. No, back then, they were trained. They were birthed into a certain vocation. In fact, it talks about James, the son of Zebedee. His father was in the boat. Why? Probably because his father was a fisherman who taught him how to fish. This is their livelihood. This is all they would have probably ever known. And it's not like, hey, let's follow Jesus for a while and if it doesn't work out, it's okay, like a lot of different career options and I can go to to get a different job. It's not. They dropped their nets. That's all they had. They dropped their livelihood, their source of provision and they followed Jesus. That, my friends, that's commitment. That's commitment to Jesus Christ. Like I said, I know they're not perfect but at least they made that decision to commit themselves. That's what it means to deny ourselves. You see, ultimately, one of the greatest measures of commitment is true sacrifice. If, you know, talk is cheap. We can just say, I'm committed. But you know how we really measure commitment? It's by what we are willing to lay down, what we are willing to sacrifice. If I'm committed to you, then I got to be willing to sacrifice something when it comes to it. It doesn't mean that I have to sacrifice everything all the time, but finally when push comes to shove, if I have to choose you or something else, if I say I'm committed to you, I will choose you. That is how we test commitment. And that is what Jesus is doing throughout Scripture. He's calling people to commit themselves to Him, and he's making his point by asking them what they are willing to sacrifice. Now, here's the part where some of us, we feel uncomfortable. In Just now what we read in Luke 9, 59 to 60. Jesus said to that man, follow me. But that man replied, Lord, let me go and bury my dead father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury the dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And we read things like that, and we feel uncomfortable. In fact, I'm sure many of us, we have thought this before. We might have read it and say, well, that's kind of unreasonable. It's kind of unreasonable, you know, what was going on here? But here's the situation. I believe Jesus was testing all the people's commitment. He was testing their commitment by seeing what they are willing to lay down. Honestly, this is what I believe, you know. Jesus said to this man, come, follow me. And if this man had immediately replied, I will follow you, I'm pretty sure God, Jesus would have told him, please go and tend to your family, go and tend to your father. But instead, what was the first thing on this man's mouth, out of this man's lips? He said, no, not yet. I have to go and tend to this first. It's different. If anything, it's like an excuse. And that's the interesting thing. It's, you, you know, as disciples of Jesus Christ, it's always a paradox. What does Jesus say? Those who want to gain their life shall lose it, but those who lose it for His sake shall gain it. That is how it works. I'm sure that's what would have happened. Jesus was making a point. He was teaching them. He was trying to test this person's heart by seeing what that person was willing to lay down. And what's so interesting is that we always must read it in context. Look at the next few verses again. Same thing in verse 61 and 62. Another man said, I will follow you, but first. You know, it's very important. I will follow you, Jesus, but first. Don't we say that a lot? Jesus, I will follow you, but Jesus, I will do this for you, but we always say it like this. And he says, but first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus said, the key lesson you're trying to teach here, in fact, I don't even think he may be answering that man directly. He's telling everybody, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. This reveals what Jesus was looking for. That line there, it is a challenge to commitment. He says, you give it all you've got, all the time, all the way. That is what he was looking for. Again, it's the same thing. I believe if these men had said, yes, Jesus will follow you, full stop, Jesus would have let them go and settle the, the, the matters of their family. Jesus would ask them to go and do that. But because they had excuses, they had other reasons, you know. Yes, I will follow you, but, Lord, okay, but I will do this first, I will do that first. We often fall into that trap. And then, of course, as we read in the book of Luke, there's one part further on that really makes people very uncomfortable. And that is found in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 26. And it says this, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even hate their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Well, we read this and we we start to, to react. But before you react again, remember, what did I share just now from Pastor Chuck's window? He says, more than once, Jesus deliberately addressed certain issues that quickly diminished the onlookers. It was commitment that thinned the ranks. Again, the 
the, the, the context here is that the root issue is that Jesus was testing their commitment and commitment is tested by seeing what can be sacrificed, what they are willing to sacrifice. Let's think about this passage for a moment. Let's, let's always remember, Jesus, the Lord, will never say anything that contradicts His own word. He will never tell us to do something that, that goes against His own teaching. And if He really wanted us to have a spirit of hatred towards our families, you know, he, if he really wanted to do that, then he will, he, he, it's not possible, in fact, because he cannot contradict Scripture. What does Scripture say? Does Scripture ever teach us to hate our family? No, Scripture tells us to honour your father and mother. God's Word tells us to love our wife. God's Word tells parents not to exasperate their children. God's Word tells us to love one another. So what was Jesus doing here? If anything, I will say this. Jesus was presenting a hyperbole kind of situation. He was giving the extreme example to test their commitment. Are you willing to sacrifice all this? And we must understand this is what Jesus is looking for. In fact, if we really believe that Jesus is trying to tell us to hate people, you will, you will learn this. Jesus, when He teaches something, He demonstrates it. Remember when the disciples asked how they should pray, what did Jesus do? This is how you should pray, and He shows them how to pray. But has Jesus ever shown anyone how to hate people? No, He has never done that. Because that is not the point here. And if that's all we can take back, then we have misunderstood the entire context of this passage. Because we must understand it by looking at what comes next in Luke 14, verse 27 onwards. He says, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king, he's about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the king who's coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and you ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. I think again here, powerful illustration that Jesus used. He shared about this king going to war. He shared about us building a tower, building a building. And he was teaching the people to think carefully and make their choice, to understand what is expected of them, to understand this commitment. Because his desire is not for us to meet him for a day or two. His desire is not just for us to, to, to hang about with him, to just have a party and just do all kinds of, 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 of nonsense or whatever. You know, that's this, this not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, come, follow me, be my disciple. Follow after me all the days of your life. He doesn't say, come, let's hang out together. Hey, let's, hey guys, you know, watch a movie together? Let's go catch a movie. Jesus didn't say, hey, come, let's, let's come and hang out together. Let's, let's gather people. Let's go and do fun stuff. You know, we can have a party, you know. You know, if you're, yeah, I, I, Jesus can say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm great at providing food, you know. You know, just bring some fish, some bread, you know. You've got a whole party for 5,000 people. You know, if you want some other entertainment, bring some water. You know what I'll do next, you know. Jesus wasn't, wasn't trying to have a party like that. He said, follow me and be my disciples. And the next key part, the key part of this entire passage here is summarized here. He says this, in verse 29 to 30, if you lay the foundation and you're not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. This person began to build and wasn't able to finish. What Jesus was doing in this entire passage is to say, are you willing to commit? Are you willing to commit? I'm going to give you, are you willing to even do this? That if you need to sacrifice your family. You need to sacrifice something so dear to you. Will you do it for my sake? Will you even sacrifice your own life for my sake? And if the answer is yes, then the Lord says, you can follow me. You can be my disciple. And when Jesus says this, this person wasn't able to build, uh, began to build what he wasn't able to finish. I come back to this age-old saying that many of us have heard before. Don't start what you don't intend to finish. Don't start what you don't intend to finish. If I, was, if I were to submit this to you, this is probably a paraphrase of what Jesus was saying. Don't start what you don't intend to finish. He was telling everyone that following Him takes commitment and commitment will be measured by that sacrifice. And when Jesus do that, He wasn't trying to consolidate power. He wasn't trying to say that, oh, I'm better than all of you. you know, follow me, lay down everything and follow me. I am all that matters. He, it's not that He wants to consolidate power, but it's that He wants to build a relationship with us. Because relationships always require commitment. You know, some of us, we may think, and I, we've heard that before, 
for, you know, come to church, go to cell group, you know, there's very, very high commitment. I don't want to be a church member for high commitment. You know, high commitment people is very, very demanding, very unreasonable and stuff. But you know what? If there is expectation of a high commitment, that is what unlocks the door to relationships. Because you cannot have a relationship without commitment. Similarly, we say, that, oh, I want to receive G- the love of God. But if you don't commit yourself to that relationship with Him, you will never receive that love. Relationships require commitment. You know, I've had the privilege, I've I'm a, I'm a, been a team pastor in this church for a couple of years now. I've had the privilege to start uh, to, to marry off various couples in, the, in, in, in our church. In fact, one of the first weddings, I, the second wedding I conducted was actually, I, I married off my older sister, you know, her and my brother-in-law. I was the conducting pastor for that. But, you know, when we, when we marry off couples and they come to the altar, you know what happens? The, the, the husband and the wife, they will have an exchange of vows. Okay? They, will, they will exchange vows. And what do they say? Often this is the vow that we use. It says, I so-and-so, take you, so-and-so, to be my lawfully wedded husband or wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. What is this really all about? This vow is a vow of commitment. And only when this commitment exists can there be a strong relationship. And this vow here, what's the context? It talks about what we are willing to lay down, you know. It says that all else doesn't matter, you know. It says that I'm willing to lay down my comfort. I'm willing to lay down what my own desires so that we will make this work. What does it say here? It says to have and to hold from this day for, for better or for worse. For richer or for poorer. In sickness or in health. It means come what may, come hell or high water, we are going to be committed to one another because that is what a relationship is built on. It's the exact same thing. We're following Jesus. Let's not think that, oh, he's just someone unreasonable. He wants us to be only committed to him and that's all. No, it's a desire for a relationship. Church, that's what Jesus is doing. That's what Jesus is doing when he calls us to follow him. Following Jesus requires commitment. And when it comes to commitment, the question I want to ask today is this. The question is not, how many of us here want to be committed to Jesus? The question is not, how many of us struggle with commitment? No, the question today is this. What aren't you willing to sacrifice? What aren't you willing to sacrifice? If we're struggling with commitment, the question is not whether I want to be committed or not. I'm sure we all want to be committed. But if we struggle with commitment, the question is what aren't we willing to sacrifice? And if we find that this list goes on and on and on and on, those are things that we need to let go of. A couple of months ago, remember I preached a a concluding sermon for our faith sermon series, is that faith is letting go. Faith is letting go. So what aren't you willing to sacrifice? And if you cannot sacrifice that, you cannot follow Jesus. I'm reminded of this famous passage in, 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 in Scripture. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. And as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honour your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Over here, you have this rich young ruler who met Jesus but could not move to the next part of following Jesus. What stopped him? What kept him at this point where he only met Jesus but he never crossed over to follow Jesus? What is in between meeting Jesus and following Jesus? commitment and he could not sacrifice that which he already owned something else had grabbed a hold of him something else was more important to him and as a result he could not let go of that he could not sacrifice and church today that's that's where many of us at many of we're here in church maybe we've even been in church for years maybe we're even leaders but to us there's no relationship with jesus it's nothing more than coming to church every single weekend or going to sell that's about it. 
We have allocated time slots for Jesus. And because of that, we're only at this meet Jesus area. It's great. It's, it's, it's okay, but it's not enough. It is a start, but it should not be the end. Because right here, we meet Jesus. But many of us, we're, we're stuck here because we're, un, we're not willing to cross that bridge of commitment. And to cross that bridge of commitment, it takes sacrifice. And so I'll ask you again, church, and maybe you should write this question down, you should ponder over it. What aren't you willing to sacrifice? So that's the first thing that it takes in order to follow Jesus. Following Jesus requires, number one, commitment. But more than commitment, there's something else that re that's required of us in order to follow Jesus. And the second thing is this, to follow Jesus, it takes change. It takes change. It takes us being willing to change ourselves so that we can become more like Jesus. And I want to say this to all of us. Someone who follows Jesus cannot live an unchanged life. Someone who follows Jesus cannot remain unchanged. It is not possible. It is impossible. What did Jesus say to the disciples when he called them? In Mark chapter 1, verses 17 to 18. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Or what, in other words, he said, we are more, we're more familiar with, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Right there, Jesus was telling the disciples, hey, you know what? If you follow me, you're going to need to change. You're going to need to change and I'm going to help you. I'm going to change you as well. He says, you are, you are, you, why, why did Jesus do this? Jesus was trying to talk to them in language that they could understand. They were all fishermen. So he, he uses uh, 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 phrases that they will understand. That's why he says you become fishers of men. Just like how, you know, any, any communicator, like when we preach in Singapore, sometimes we use a lot of Singlish. Why? Because it's a local context to it. Same thing. He was talking to them. He says, I know these guys are fishermen. Let me put it in a way they understand. All right? Guys, you guys are fishers. Uh, you guys are, yeah, are, are, are fishermen. You're not fishers. <laughs> guys, you guys are, are, are fishermen. And as fishermen, you go out and you fish for fish. But you know what? Come follow me and I'll make you fish for men. Now, to be, to be perfectly honest, if I was, I don't know, if, if I was Simon or whoever, I will sit there and like, huh? I, I don't understand. I don't understand. What, what fishes of men? I mean, what, I'm going to, you know, or I, I need a very big net. You know, some people are a bit bigger. I need a bigger, even bigger net to catch some of them. But what do you mean? But whatever it is, they chose to follow him. They say, you know what? I may not fully understand. In fact, the more you study the disciples, you realize... They made a choice to commit themselves to Jesus, but they had no idea what they were getting into. They didn't fully understand what it entails, but they said, you know what? I want to follow this man. I want to commit myself to follow him. And so they followed him. And when they followed him, you will see that the disciples began to change. They did not change. They did not just change their careers. They changed their destiny. They changed their purpose, their characters, their attitudes. It all began to change. Why? Because God has and always will be in the business of changing people, of transforming them. But He does not do it uh, when we are unwilling. He does it when we are willing. He's always in the business of changing us. But I know some of us, we may sit here and we think, hey, you know, you come to church and you talk so much about God loving us. And you know what? If God is such a loving God, He'll love me just the way I am. A loving God wouldn't try and change me. You know what? Nothing is further from the truth. Let's look at what Scripture itself says. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If we, remember, if we look at the New Living Translation, it says that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. I like what it says in the, in, the, in the more traditional translation we understand. It says, old things have passed away. That's so powerful, you know. What does it mean to pass away? It means old things are dead. They've passed away. They're gone forever. There's no more of it. It's completely dead. Sealy, mati, bole, everything gone. No more. That's what it's saying. That's what we must remember. And so if we say that we follow Jesus, but there's still remnants of things that we're unwilling to change, then we have not really followed Jesus. Because following Jesus requires us to change. The old things must pass away. And I like what Max Lucado says. He says this, God loves you just the way you are, but He refuses to leave you that way. He wants you to be just like Jesus. 
God loves you just the way you are, but He refuses to leave you that way. Let us sing into our minds and our hearts. He loves us, but He does not want us to remain that way. That's what following Jesus is about. It's about us being changed and transformed to become more and more like Jesus. And just because God wants us to change, to become something else, it doesn't mean that He doesn't love us or He doesn't want us or doesn't like us. Because some of us, we feel that, hey, if God truly loves us unconditionally, then He would never want us to change. Again, that's not true. If God loves us unconditionally, that doesn't mean that He'll never want us to change. Let me explain it to you. You know, when a child is born, a newborn child, have you ever noticed that this child is unconditionally loved by his or her parents? We've, we, you know that classic scene, you know, where, where they're in the hospital room and, and, and after the, the, the baby was born, you know, the baby is still fresh, okay? The baby, and they're, 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 the parents are holding the baby. Why? What's very fresh? fresh, right? I mean, then what, what you want? You want Thompson come out or what? You know? It's, Okay, new. Okay, the baby is new, all right? <laughs> so they have, they're holding this new baby in their hands. And you know what? Those parents there, they love this child unconditionally. They, you know, they, they, you know, parents and they hold the baby and they, and all those kind of things. They, they love the child. And if anything were to happen right there, this father or mother would lay down their lives for that child right there and then. But that is unconditional love because that child has not done anything to deserve that love yet. That child has not done anything to deserve that love yet. If anything, right, maybe that child has done things that should not deserve the mom's love. Why you keep kicking me, you know, this nine months, you know, I don't like you, that kind of thing. Okay, this child has done nothing. This child was just born and just born, this child didn't come out. Nah, I got O level, six points already, you know. It has done nothing to deserve that love. Has not bought any Father's Day present, any Mother's Day present. Has not done anything like that. But these parents love that kid unconditionally. But as much as those parents, and all the parents here, as much as you love that child unconditionally, are there any parents here that you've never scolded your child? You've never asked your child to change, to do something else? You have done that before. Because unconditional love does not mean that you will not be willing to change. You see, we, we, must understand, we, we must understand. And sometimes that's something we can never understand. And, and it's just like, when, when you go and visit someone's, someone who just had a, had a new child, you'll never understand that, that love, that love between that, that, that father and mother to that, to that child. Because it's different. And that, that love is so strong. That love is so strong. You, you know, to, 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 to those parents, right, no matter what, the child is always perfect. Right? The child is always perfect. But you and I know, you know, when we go and see other babies, we've seen some ugly-looking babies before, you know? Okay? You know, we've, we've, we've seen some of them, we think, oh, this baby... But to the parents, it's always perfect. We look at this baby, what well, is baby quite fat, ah? but the parents say, no, it's chubby, you know, in the pink of health. You know, what well, is baby a bit scrawny? No, this baby is petite, very cute, you know, you know very, 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 very compact size. All, all kind of things. But when they, they love the child so much, but no matter how much they love their child, if their child requires correction, if their child needs to change for the better, those parents will insist that it happens. I was reading this book, and this author was writing about his own, his own encounter, his own experience with his daughter. And his daughter was a toddler, and he wrote that, you know, one, he used to bring his, do his daughter out when she was a toddler to the, to the park. And she'll go there and she'll play in, in, in the playground and everything. And one day she was playing and he was sit, sit, uh, sitting on the park bench and he saw an ice cream man come. And he thought, you know, it'll be a nice treat. Let me buy an ice cream for my daughter. So he, he called the daughter over. He walked to the ice cream man. He bought that ice cream. And after he bought that ice cream, he turned to pass the ice cream to the daughter and to put it in her, her mouth for her to eat. But when he turned and he looked at his daughter, her mouth was full of dirt and sand. Because she had been lying and rolling around and she had been putting dirt and, 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 and sand in her mouth. And he looked at her and he's like, what are you doing? You've got dirt and, and, and stuff in, in, in your mouth. And he writes this, you know. I saw her with all that dirt and all that sand in her mouth. Did I love her with that dirt in her mouth? Absolutely. Was she any less my daughter with that dirt in her mouth? Of course not. But was I going to allow her to keep that dirt in her mouth? Absolutely not. He carried her, he brought her to the water fountain, washed out that dirt so that he can give her that ice cream and let her enjoy it. You understand what I'm saying here? 
We can love someone, but unconditional love does not mean we're not willing to change. That's just what happened to this father and his daughter is exactly what, what, what Max Lucado says. God loves us just as we are. He sees us in sin. He sees us with all our struggles. Does He love us any less? No, He loves us so much. But He cannot stand idly by and let us continue in it. He will want to carry us to that water fountain, to cleanse us, to wash away that dirt, to change us. That is how it is. The truth about this, church, is that very often we say that we follow Jesus, but we don't really follow Jesus because we're not willing to change. We still want to play around in that sand pit. We still want to eat dirt. We still want to put sand in our, in our mouth. And when, when, when someone tries to come and change us and say, hey, you shouldn't, put, you shouldn't put dirt in your mouth, we say, no, I want to put dirt in my mouth. I like putting dirt in my mouth. I'm going to live my life putting dirt in my mouth. It is my right to put dirt in my mouth. We're unwilling to change. But if we say that we follow Jesus, we cannot live that way. We cannot carry on living unchanged. And it's very easy to measure for all of us. A very simple exercise for all of us. Let's measure, let's measure whether we're really following Jesus. Let's measure this change in our life. Let's think about it. Very simple. Ask yourself this question. Okay? How different would it be if Jesus lived your life for one day? I hear some people giggling. Okay, because maybe you think, well, I should do very badly. Right? What happened if Jesus lived your life for one day? It means instead of you, okay, He is the one who goes through your daily life. He is the one who looks after your kids. He is the one who has to tend to, to those annoying people around you. He is the one who has to look after your family. He is the one who has to go to work. He is the one that gets caught in that stupid traffic jam. He is the one that spills coffee all over himself. He is the one that is scolded by, by your boss. He is the one that trips over your untied shoelace and he falls and he breaks his nose. He is the one that goes through every single thing. How different would your life be? Maybe you should list it out. Maybe you might feel that, like, oh, if Jesus lived my life, there'd be a lot less vulgarities. If Jesus left, uh, lived my life, there'd be a lot more prayer. If Jesus lived my life, there'd be a, bit more, uh, a lot more love. If Jesus lived my life, maybe there'll be a bit more courage. There'll be a lot less fear. And if that list is still very long, it means that we're not, we're not allowing God to change us. Or rather, when we look at that list, it's not for us to feel bad, you know, wow, I'm so far off from Jesus. No, we look at that list so they say, oh, I know what I need to work on. I know what the areas I need to change. What are the things I need to do? If you, 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 I think you, many of us remember back in the 90s where this famous slogan, right? WWJD. What would Jesus do? And it's everywhere, you know, put it on our, all these uh, armbands, wristbands, uh, put it on our ankle, put it on our backs, WWJD. And it's always to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do in this situation? You know, whatever has happened, something really terrible happened to you, at that moment, ask yourself, what would Jesus do? It's not to make you feel bad, but it's to ask yourself, what do I need to become? What do I need to do to become more and more like Jesus? And if we take this exercise seriously, and we study the scripture and we allow the Lord to empower us to change. That is when we will transform. And let's make no mistake about it. We must become more and more like Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 to 24 says this, You were taught with regard to your former self, your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Or many of us will know Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, that says, follow God's example. Or, we remember the other, a more traditional version we're used to, be imitators of God. Why? Because we're supposed to change. We are supposed to change. We should not be living our same life. What did we read just now? If any man be in Christ, he is a new person. He is a new creation. The old things have passed away. And that's why Pastor Rick Joyner makes a statement. He says, if we are followers of Christ, we are His disciples and should have the primary devotion in our lives to see as Jesus sees, to think as Jesus thinks, and understand with the same heart that Jesus has. That's what it means to follow Jesus, to become more and more like Him. So that as we follow Jesus, we will change and become just like Him. You see, when we follow Jesus, let me, let's, use a, let's use a literal example, okay? Let's say I'm following Jesus. Imagine that Jesus is leading me. He's in front of me and He's following me. And I'm following Jesus. So wherever He goes, 
I follow, right? I mean, he's just in front of me, he's leading me, he's going, he's, he's, wherever he's going, I just keep following, whether it's up here, it's back there, I keep following Jesus. You notice something? If you are always following Jesus, you will never remain stagnant. You will never remain in the same place. Why? Because this is the change I'm talking about. When you're following Jesus, not just for one day, not just for two seconds, not just for a month, a few years or whatever, but for your entire life, your life will never be stagnant because you're changing each and every day. Every day your mind is being renewed and transformed by His Word. We will never be the same. That is what following Jesus is all about. That's why He starts off telling us the commitment. It's all. It's your entire life. Not just one part, not just another, another part. Everything. And as we look through the entire Bible, we see how God is always in the business of changing people, of transforming them. And it's one thing in, in, in Scripture that you always read about how God ch changes and transforms people. You know what He does? You, one very common thing you see, whether Old Testament or New Testament, is the changing of people's names. Notice that when they encounter God, God gives them a new name, a new destiny, a new purpose because He is giving them a new commission. You notice that in the Old Testament, okay, some examples we have, we have Abram. Abram, his name meant exalted father. He was renamed to Abraham, father of multitudes. Sarai, her name meant princess, my princess. She was renamed to Sarah, the mother of all nations. Jacob, it meant supplanter, it meant deceiver, was renamed to Israel where God prevails. Look at the change, the change of their destiny, the change of who they are. They were being transformed by the Lord. That is what God is doing. And it happens again later on. But you know what? God is always changing us because He knows that we should not remain who we are. But He wants to change us so that we can, He wants to transform us into being just like Him in all righteousness, in all holiness, so that we can be used by Him to fulfill that unique destiny. You know, we're all not perfect. None of us are. If you look at, 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 at the men and women of the Bible, you know they're not, they're not perfect. You know, if I, my favorite Bible character, okay, is from the Old Testament, if my favorite Bible character has got to be Moses. I mean, Moses is one, he's one cool, he's one cool guy, right? I mean, you wanna, if I want to be anyone, I want to be like, like, like Moses. I mean, he had a staff. He had a, he had a staff. I mean, how cool is it to walk around with a staff? You know? And you have a staff, and you throw the staff on the floor, it becomes a snake, you know? Like, I mean, how, how fantastic is that? And you take the staff and you walk around, kind of feel like a wizard, like Gandalf like that, and you're walking around, you know, and you can go up to, I don't know, maybe you go to Singapore River, you know, plant the staff there, see what happens, you know? Uh, but we, we can do all that. And, and I mean, Moses is such a great guy. He, 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 he was so close to the Lord. He called, I mean, through him, plagues came into, into, into Egypt. And through, I mean, he's the one who goes up to Mount Sinai. He encounters, he sees Jesus face to face. He encounters him. He, he, he receives the Ten Commandments. And he can proceed down and break all the Ten Commandments at one go, but still be loved by the Lord. He can always have such close contact with the Lord. He's such a great guy. I want to be just like Moses when I grow up. But I remember one day I was reading the Scriptures. And you know what? We read, we always remember all this. You know, maybe we, we read the Bible a bit like Go 90 FM. Just remember the good stuff. We just hear the good stuff. We look at all the good stuff. We remember Moses about all these things. But we forget who Moses was. Do you know who Moses was? A murderer. Why was he on the run? He was a murderer. He was a murderer that was caught by God and he was changed and transformed. The same thing happens in the New Testament. We see more names being changed. Simon, who means, his name means God hears, was renamed to Peter. And Peter means this rock. And Jesus said, on this rock, I shall build my church. Saul was renamed to Paul. The meaning of Saul is, is asked for. If anything, there's a bit of pride in that, where you are needed and you are asked for. But what did God do? He transformed Saul into Paul. And he becomes a humble person. If anything, what I'm trying to say here is that when we follow Jesus, we will be changed, we will be transformed. And if you look at the disciples' lives in general, you will see the biggest change coming uh, um, after Jesus was arrested, after he was crucified, and after he was resurrected and he rose to heaven. When Jesus was arrested on that night, he was arrested. What happened in Mark chapter 14, verse 50? It says, everyone deserted him and fled. Everyone deserted Jesus and fled. And of course, we know, yeah, Peter, a bit gung-ho, everything, no one slides off people's ears and, 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 and whatever. But yet, Peter denied Jesus three times. 
And after Jesus was crucified, after Jesus died and Jesus was buried in the tomb, what does it say in John chapter 20, verse 19? On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together with the doors locked. They were in hiding. They locked the doors for fear of the Jewish leaders. But suddenly Jesus had resurrected He already and He suddenly appeared before them and He said, Peace be with you. What am I trying to say? Is that if you understand the disciples, the disciples were people who needed to be changed. These are people who struggled. These are people who were cowards. These are people who were afraid. These are people who were not strong enough. These are people who will be arguing amongst themselves who is greater, who is bigger, who is stronger. That is who they are. But when they encountered Jesus, their lives would change. And as we go into the book of Acts and beyond, we see how their lives are totally transformed. You talk about how they were cowardly and how they were afraid. Well, do you know how, the, how these disciples died? How did they finally become martyrs for the Lord? Well, at least most of them. Well, Simon Peter, what happened to him? Crucified. Thaddeus, crucified. Simon and Zealot, crucified. Andrew, tortured, then crucified. Philip, imprisoned, then crucified. Bartholomew, beaten, then crucified. James, son of Zebedee, murdered by sword. Thomas, murdered by spear. Matthew, murdered by sword also. James, son of Alphaeus, beaten, stoned, and clubbed to death. And John, exiled to the island of Patmos. They gave everything. They have, uh, finally, many of them, they paid the ultimate sacrifice. They were completely committed to what they were doing. Why? Because they were changed. They were transformed. They, when, 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 when Jesus came to empower them, they changed. They became who God wanted them to be. They entered into that destiny. And I know not all of this, you know, there, there may be conflicting accounts on how the disciples died. Some of them are not very clear because some are mentioned in Scripture, some are not. But whatever it is, if we understand what the book of Acts teaches us, is that the disciples suddenly became, they, 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 it's almost like they became people that, they became completely new people. They were no longer who they were. Peter, the one who denied Jesus, well, on the day of Pentecost, he preached, and how many thousand came to know the Lord? Totally different. Because they entered, they changed, and they entered into a destiny. And to quote what Paul says to the Galatians, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith from, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. That is the ultimate transformation. When we follow Jesus and we start to change, we start to open up our lives, we allow Christ to live in us. That's what it means when Jesus says, Carry a cross, deny yourself and carry a cross daily. Allow Him to change us. And that is what it's about. Church, following Jesus means that we have to change. It means that we have to change. And this change involves both God and us working in our own lives. And the question today, for this second point then to ask, is what needs to change in your life? What needs to change in your life? Maybe it's a, it's a habit. Maybe it's a habit that some of us have, a bad habit. Maybe we're in a habit of smoking, of, of, of hurting ourselves. Some of us are in a habit of, of, of using vulgarities. Maybe there's a behavioral change that we need to make. Some of us, we're very hot-tempered. We don't care about other people. We just explode at them. We just scold them. We think we don't, we don't really care. Maybe it's an attitude. Some of us, we think that prayer and fasting is not important. Some of us think that reaching out, evangelism is not important. Some of us think that, that being part of the community is not important. Well, maybe these are things that need to change. And if we're not willing to change, it means this, we're not willing to follow Jesus. Maybe it's an issue of our priorities. So today, what needs to change in your life? And so as I share this, I, the message I have for today is come follow Jesus. And what does it take for us to follow Jesus? Well, two things. Number one, it takes commitment to follow Jesus. And not just commitment, it takes change. A willingness to change, a desire to change. That is how we can follow Jesus. And that's the message I, I have for us today. And I believe for all of us here, some of you, I know you're, you're new here, you've never given life to Jesus before, and some of us, we've been Christians for a long time. But whatever it is, the call today is that the Lord is saying, come, follow me. 
come follow me. And whether it's the area of commitment or the area of change, I want to explain something to all of us. And I think it's a very important note to, to, to finish off on. Is that both commitment and change requires time. It requires time. Commitment needs to have time. You can't be, it's not just about being committed one second, two seconds. It, it's about committed for a life. It takes time for that. Change. Change takes time as well. Can God zap us and transform us immediately? Of course He can. But that's not always how God works. You know, sometimes we think, oh, you know, being changed means I, let me come and I respond to the Lord and I pray and the Lord zaps me, you know, and I'm, 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 I'm completely transformed. But remember what my dad taught us in the second week of this year? He says one thing about us Christians. Very often, we're so fixated on the either or and that we neglect the both end. Change is not either or, you know. It's not, oh, I changed in my own effort and then, or, or is God just zapped me and I, I changed. No, it's both and. We need our own effort and God needs to come and live in us as well. We need Jesus Christ in our lives. You see, yes, I know some of us, we may think that we don't measure up. But you know, I want to encourage you. I don't say this so that you feel beaten up or, 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 or you feel like you're let down or whatever. But I want to say this. There are many of us, we are works in progress. Sure, we want to follow Jesus. But to be frank, I said, you yeah, know, if we follow Jesus, we'll never be standing. Yeah, that's a, that's a perfect world. But you know what? You and I were not perfect. I know in my own life, I try to follow Jesus as, as much as I can. But at times, I stagnate. Sometimes I even go backwards. Sometimes I turn away from Him. But you know what? God still loves us and He's calling us back to Him. He's calling us to follow Him. And we need to come and change. We need to allow God to come and move in our life. It's both us changing together with God's power in our life. Remember, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. What does it say? I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. What does it mean in this verse? This verse is a very powerful verse because it talks about both us and God. It says, I can do. I can do means I do, not God do, not Jesus does it. I do it. I can do all things. But it is Christ who gives me strength. You know, we talk about change. We need to understand this. I know many of us, sometimes when I talk about change, we know. And some of us, we really want to change. But some of us, we've been struggling because, well, you know, I just can't seem to change. I've, and I've heard, this, I've heard this statement many times, you know. Oh, Pastor, I tried, to, I tried to kick this habit before. You know, I've gone to so many prayer meetings, so many, I've gone to around the world. People, great men of, of God have, have laid their hands on me before they prayed for me, but still there's no change. You know why? Because there's a wrong understanding there. A lot of us, we expect, they say, oh, change, what's change going to be like? Change means I come before the Lord. I kneel before the Lord. I open up my hands, you know, I pray in tongues, I do all that. And suddenly, the Lord zaps me. Maybe for, for us, we have, we have that bad habit of, of using vulgarities, of cursing with the, those same lips that we used to worship God, we use that to curse people. Maybe we are in that bad habit and we think that suddenly, you know, we go and pray and God will zap us. And the next time something bad happens, you're just about to say a curse word and suddenly, so, oh, suddenly no voice. You think suddenly God takes full control. That's not how it works, you know. Very often, let me explain to you how change is like. It requires our own effort. I've shared this before. But it's good to remember some of these stories. I, I struggle with road rage, at least a lot more in the, in the past. Now, it's, I, really, I really don't know. I'm quite, I'm quite relaxed now on, on the road. But I used to, to, to struggle a lot on the, on the road. I'm, by, by nature, I'm a very implosive person. Okay? And if you know, implosive people are actually worse than explosive people. Explosive people are people who are, they are very loud, they always explode, you know. When something happens, they just they always vent their frustration straight away. Explosive people are not very scary, you know why? Because if they keep exploding, there's only so much they can explode. There's only so much energy that they have. And it'll always be, it'll be a lot of explosions, but quite small ones. Implosive people, they keep packing things in. Hurt, pain, whatever, they pack it in, pack it in. And finally, when they finally explode, right? You know, that's how a, that's how a nuclear reaction works. Okay? They implode and they explode. It, it contains so much and then it finally explodes. And it's a huge explosion. And that's how I am. When I drive, right? Okay, in the past, I, I get very I get very annoyed by 
by people on the road, you know, and, and people will cut me off and, and, and I, I, will get, I will get very angry. I will, I will shout in the car, you know, I will, I will, I will bang the window, you know, and, and I'll do a lot of, I'll do a lot of nonsense. But the thing is, I never direct it at them. I keep it within the car because I'm very in, like, impulsive. Okay, so it's always in there. And you know who suffers the most? Serene, because she's in the car with me. Okay? And it's annoying to her, she gets upset and 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 and, and all that. And and I always have this struggle. And it's something that I've gone to a lot before. I've, in fact, I remember one of my cell leaders earlier, when I first became a pastor, you know, before I was a team pastor, I went up to one of my leaders and said, can you help me can you pray with me? Because I really cannot control my temper on the road. Okay? I cannot control it. I'm, I'm very hot-tempered uh, uh, on the road. If somebody cuts me off, I will speed up to go and stare down, have a stare down with that person. And you know, you know, the, you know the side stare, you drive. And then... I will do that and I will stare at, I, will, I will death stare that guy before I, 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 I zoom off and all that and I said I need help and, I've, and he prayed for me I prayed before, I asked God come and change me but you know the more I pray for God to change me you know how God brings about that change? by having giving me more encounters on the road sometimes we think God come and change me and then we think wow oh, God I prayed already what that means today I go on the road well, it never rains when I'm driving the sun is always shining got rainbow in the sky you know I'm driving there it's always, the road is always empty you know the moment I go out city boom all the cars disappear all the cars I got got angels escorting me on you know you know sometimes that's what we think but that's not how it is the more I prayed that the more I encountered this kind of thing and you know when I always encounter such nonsense on the road when I'm going to church to lead worship or when I'm going to church to preach. There's one time, I drove, I was driving to Teens Excite to preach and some guy hit me, a van hit me and then sped off, you know. Oh, I'll tell you, uh, that's it, you know, okay. I, there was a high-speed chase down Lonnie Road, okay, because uh, I sped up, I cut in front of that guy and I pulled him over in the middle of the road because he hit my car, okay. And, and that's, that's the kind of person I was. And then there's this one, a, a different occasion where I was really going to TX. Going to, back then, you... Teen Excite was at uh, uh, TCT, Church Community Theatre, now Gateway Theatre, right? And you know, those of us who drive, you know, parking at TCT, the, the parking lot beside it, has one of the most irritating gantries ever, okay? Now it's not bad already because one side is season parking, one side is uh, uh, hourly parking. But you know, it's kind of like, okay, just stay with me, I just understand. You, you know, you drive, then there's a left turn to go to the loading bay, then you drive maybe five metres down the road, there's another left turn where it's to go into the parking lot. Right? But the loading bay, right, can actually be a shortcut to the parking lot as well. But usually we don't do that, you know, because we're nice, let, let the loading bay be for the people, loading bay. So after they, they unload people or they unload their goods, they're supposed to drive and turn out. They cannot go into the car park there. So I was very nice, like, and I, I might drive to, to TCT, going to go and park. And then suddenly there's a queue, and then, you know, I hate queuing up for a parking lot. So okay, never mind. It's okay, chill, chill, relax. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to preach, I'm going to lead. I was going to preach that day at TX, and I was going to lead worship at night. So I said, you know, relax, okay, the three cars, is okay. Let me just wait there at the back, you know. I'm still early for things inside. You know, let's, 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 you know, let's put on some Christian music, you know. Let's, let's worship the Lord. Let's pray, you know. Let's have a good, comfortable environment in there. And so slowly, you know, wait. Let's wait, you know. And then the next one is my turn already, you know. So it means that the next car that comes out, the gantry will open for me and I can go in and it'll be my turn to park. And so a car was coming out and the gantry was about to open. And just then, another car came in by the loading bay. And he drove, drove, drove and I was staring at the car. I was waiting here to go into the gantry, right? This car goes beside me, comes by this road here and then I thought, okay, like, he's going to turn out but the gantry opens and he turns left and he goes into the car park and he takes my lot, you know and I tell you, oh, oh my goodness I tell you, at that moment, okay I was going to say some things that is very unbecoming of a church pastor and and I remember right there, okay I was like, I couldn't believe it and I remember I rose, I, let, I lifted up my hand I was going to, you know when you're angry you don't just you know, people were angry, don't just pop out, you know, that kind of thing, you know. You will vent all that frustration on that horn. You will punch it, you will whack it, and you will hold it down for at least the next two to three minutes. And I was about to do that, you know. And I, was, and I kid you not, just as I was about to do that, it felt like, it felt like time stopped. It felt like time stopped and I heard very clearly. One of the most clear times in my life I've heard the voice of God. I heard this voice telling me, Daniel, if you give in to this anger right now, all that anointing that's upon you for this weekend, for ministry, all that prayer, all that time and effort you spend seeking me to, to, to be used by me, all that will be gone. All that will be for nothing. If you give in right now. And I remember my hand was right at the, the horn there. I haven't pressed it yet. And I sat there 
and I literally looked at God and said, well, since you put it like that, and so I, I pulled my hand away, and I stopped. And I sat there, I waited, I prayed. And next thing I know, another car came out, the gantry opened, and I went in, and, and I really let go. I let go of the entire situation. And I, and, and, and I, I, I in front of you, I sumpa, and I didn't do anything bad. Uh. It's not, I walk, where's, where's that guy? I uh? go, go and find him, you know. <laughs> oh, oh, he parked already, and then I got a present for you. Take out my key. No, no, I was, I was good. I totally let it, I let it slide. And I remember I went in and I, and I preached a great sermon. At least I think it was great. And, well, people give their life to the Lord, so it was, it was good. And, and it was a great time of worship after that. But that's what it's about. Very often, that's how change is. And you know what? Every time I'm on the road, just because I have that encounter already, doesn't mean that I... I I don't encounter things on the road. Still, when I'm driving to, to church now, someone will cut me off and whatever. You know, now I have to, it's still a commit, I have to commit myself to this change. That Lord, help me. Lord, really, help me, please. So I'm driving to church, oh, please come, cut, cut, filter, filter. <laughs> but that's what, that's what change is like. But what, no matter how difficult it is, maybe some of you is different from me, maybe some of you, that change is a very frightful one. But remember, what does is, what is the Word of God say? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You can do it because He gives you that strength. And we've done a share with you this final story. And then we'll close. You know, there was this lady a long time ago who had a small house on the seashore of Ireland. Of Ireland. And it was, at, it was during the turn of the century. And she was quite wealthy, but she was quite stingy at the same time. And people in the community were very surprised when she was the first person to get electricity in her home back then. Okay, so she got electricity, they came and they installed uh, everything and lighting and all that. And one day, she was at home and a man appeared at her door. And this man was, uh, was, a, was, from, the, was from the power company. He was there to check the meter. And he said, oh, I'm here to check your meter. I want to find out if everything is, is, is your power running fine? Because on our reading, you are barely using, and you, there's barely any power consumption. Are you actually using a power? Or is, that, or is that a problem? And this lady says, oh, yeah, yeah, I am using the power and it's, and it's, uh, it's fine. He said, oh, how do you use your power? He says, she says, oh, every evening when the sun sets, I on all the lights long enough so I can light my candles and then I switch off the light. <laughs> and as I read that, what's the lesson here? The lesson is this. She's tapped into the power but doesn't use it. Her house is connected but not altered. If anything, this lady, she wants to change. She wants, I mean, the fact that she paid money to, to, to install electricity and all that, she wants to be committed to something. But she's not willing to go through with it all the way. She's not willing to change all the way. She still wants to hold on to some of the old things. But remember what is Lord, the, the Word of God said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, old things have passed away. Here, she, this lady is what she's doing. On the lights. So that she can continue her old habits. And some of us, that's where we're at. We come to church, we keep saying we want change, we want commitment, blah, blah, blah. blah. But, but just like her, we, we keep living in our old habits. And the problem is this, because many of us, we're contented to meet Jesus. We're not con- we don't want to follow Him. But you know what? It's only when you follow Him that you will find yourself tapped into that power. You know, I was going to share this later on, but I'm just going to skip ahead for the video, guys. Just, I'm going to share with you four things that I wrote. I was reading some other things and I took some of it, I paraphrased it, and I wrote these four statements as I was putting this sermon together. And these four, sermons, four statements are like this. Number one, to only meet Jesus is cheap. It costs us nothing. But to follow Christ is costly. And He asks us first to consider the great cost. Number two, when we meet Jesus, we see His work for us. But when we follow Jesus, we experience His work in us. I know some of you want to take this one. You can take it down, it's all right. But there's a difference between meeting Jesus and following Jesus. It costs us greatly, but when you follow Jesus, that's when you experience His work in you. i got two more. Let me share the third one. Meeting Jesus doesn't mean that we will bear fruit. But the Bible says that followers of Jesus will be known by their fruit. And number four, 
Many meet Jesus to save their souls. Not enough follow Jesus to glorify Christ. That's the difference between meeting Jesus and following Jesus. It's very inward looking. Many of us come in, how can I save myself? But you know what? A follower will move beyond that and say, I want to glorify Christ in everything that I do. I'm not here just to consume the fruit. I'm here to be known by my fruit, by the fruit that comes from the Lord. And today, this is the message that, that, that we all need to hear. And I know some of us here, we've never given our life to Jesus before. But today, I want to tell you, there's something so much more than life. There's so much, something so much more to our lives. It's not just what we, we, we think it's all about. It's not just our career, our work and all that. God wants us to enter into a relationship with Him. We talk so much about following Jesus. Let's look at what the whole passage says in, in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 25. Jesus said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And he goes on, Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self or their very soul? Today, there's some of us here who have never given life to Jesus before and there's that sense of emptiness. Or maybe some of us were searching for, for, for answers. We said that there must be more to life than this. Well, that's why you're here. You're not here by accident. You're not here by coincidence. You're here because the Lord is calling out to you. Today, let, why don't, let this be a day where you choose to follow Jesus because there's so much more in life. The Lord has a special destiny, a special purpose for you. And today, as you say, I want to follow the Lord, you know what? Your life will never be the same again because He is here and His Word says you can do all things through Him who gives you strength. So right now, can I invite all of us to close our eyes and bow our heads all over Touch Centre and over there in Suntech City as well. And I want to close off this message giving us an opportunity to respond. I know some of us who have never given our life to Jesus before. But today, why don't you take this opportunity and say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Not just today, not just for a week, but for my entire life. And you may not understand the Lord, you may still be unsure, but today, why don't you take that step of faith and allow the Lord to move in your life. His word says, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Come, follow Him and encounter Him. Know that He is good for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Don't take our word for it. Come and experience it for yourself. You will go through that. You will receive His power and you will see that your life will never be the same again. And if today that's you, you want to respond, here's how, what we're going to do. In a moment's time, I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. And this prayer is specially designed for you to, to pray, to receive the Lord into your life, to say that you want to follow Him for the, all the days of your life. And how I'm going to do this, I'm going to say it out loud. And I want you to follow along with me. Say everything I say word for word. Follow after me line by line. And I want the Christians here to pray along. Some of us maybe we've backslided and you need to pray along as well. Some of us maybe we've been coming to church every single week, but we're content to just meet Jesus. Today, why don't you make this prayer as well? Recommit yourself to say, Lord, I want to follow you. I'm not content to just meet you every single week, but I want to follow you every single day, every single moment of my life. And so with that, I'm going to lead us in this prayer. And you pray along with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear, Dear Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father Thank you for your great love for me. Thank, Thank you for your great, great love, love for me. me. Thank you for giving me a purpose. Thank, Thank you for giving me a purpose. purpose. And sending your son for me. And sending your son for me. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I know that you died on the cross for my sins. I know that you died on the cross for my sins. Today, today, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. I open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you. Come into my life. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Be my Lord and Savior. I commit myself to you. I commit myself to your teaching. To your, to your ways. To your ways. Come and change me. Come and change me. Strengthen me. Strengthen me. Empower me to change. Empower me to change. Let me be just like you. Let me be just like you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. With all our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I believe that there's some of us here who prayed this prayer for the first time this morning. If that's you, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three in a short while's time. And when you hear me say three, all those of you who prayed this prayer for the first time today, I want to invite you to lift your hands straight up wherever you are. And by lifting your hand up, you're saying, Pastor, I pray this prayer with you. And I want you to lift your hand up so that I know where you are and who you are so that I can pray a prayer blessing for you. And maybe you didn't pray this prayer out loud. 
you were quietly praying along in your heart. Well, why don't you lift your hands straight up at the count of three as well? Or maybe you didn't do anything, but right now, something is prompting you to respond. Well, at the count of three, you lift your hands straight up as well. I'm going to count all over this place. Yeah, you may have questions, you may have uncertainties, but you know what? I'm not telling you to chuck those aside. I'm telling you to hold on to that. Come and talk through it with us. We want to help you grow and understand. But right now, why don't you take this step of faith? And come and respond to the Lord. Both here and over there at Santa, I'm going to count. One, two, and three. Just lift your hands straight up if there's anyone who prayed this prayer for the first time. Yes, I see a number of hands over here in, in Touch Centre, over there in Sun Tech City as well. Keep your hands lifted up. Is there anyone else? Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Keep it lifted up. Is there anyone else all over this place, up there in the balcony, over there at Sun Tech? Yes, we can, I can see your hands through the screen at Sun Tech there. Keep it lifted up. I want to pray for you right now. Lord, I thank you for every single one of these hands that have been lifted up because these hands represent life, they represent souls. And Lord, today we rejoice as they make this decision to follow you. Lord, we ask that you come and you move in their life. And I speak over each and every one of you that from this day forth, your life will never be the same again because the Lord your God lives in you. It is no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. So I bless you with this. We set you apart. In Jesus' most mighty name we pray. You may put your hands down. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we just thank the Lord for all that He's done this morning? And let's just stand over here and, and, and in Santa. And come on, let's put our hands again together to just thank the Lord, to just praise the Lord for, for His Word and for our friends who responded this morning. Hallelujah. And this is what we're going to do right now. There were quite a number of hands lifted up here in TC and over there in, in Santa. Here's what I'm going to do. In a moment, I'm going to count to three again. And this time when I count to three, I want to invite all those of you who responded to grab your belongings and make your way to the front over here, over there at Suntech, alright? It's alright, you're not going to come alone. The friend or the whole group of friends who came with you, they'll all come down with you because we want to get the whole church to pray for you. And I think it's very important for us to take that step of, of faith. And some of you, I know you made this decision in a private setting or in a cell group setting. Why don't you come up as well? And some of you, you've been away from the church for a long time. Well, you make your way down as well. And I know some of you, you may not have lifted up your hand, but you want to respond. Tell the friends beside you, they'll be happy to come down with you. And FCBC members, if you brought a friend, just ask, would you like to respond? I'll be happy to go with you, alright? So at the count of three, you make your way down or you tell the person beside you and you all come down together, both here and over there at Suntech and church, let's welcome them, alright? Ready? One, two, and three. Come on, make your way down, grab your stuff. We want to pray for you. We want to rejoice together with you, both here and over there in Suntech City. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Just come, wherever you are. If you're up in the balcony, wait for you. Over there at Suntech, we'll wait for you. Just come, just come. Yes, over there is Santa, so I'll make your way forward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just look at me for a moment, and all those of you at the front, just, just look at me, and I know over there at Santa can see me through the screen, but I just want to say this to all of you. Today, as you make this decision, you know, we're so, we're so happy. And the Bible says that for everyone who decides to follow Jesus, the heavens, they, they rejoice. The angels are, are rejoicing. And so are we here. But I want to tell you something that many times people have different ideas about what it means to follow Jesus, or about what it means to become a Christian. And sometimes some people think, you know, oh, you come to church, the pastor always tells you, you know, come and give your life to Jesus and life will be perfect after that. Well, over here, that's not what we do. And every week I say the same thing. When I preach, I always say this, life will always have its ups and downs. Today you make this decision, it doesn't mean that life will be perfect. In fact, Jesus himself said, in this world, in this life, we will face trouble. But you know what? No matter what trouble comes into your life, you will not face it alone. Because this is what the Word of God says, that you can be strong and courageous. You do not need to be afraid because God is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never abandon you. And we brought you to the front here today also because this family is also here with you. And we want to take this time to pray for you right now. So all those of you responded here and over there in Suntec, can you just close your eyes and bow your heads and all the church members, let's just stretch our hands towards them and let's come and speak a word of blessing over them. Lord, we thank you for our friends who have responded to your word this morning that today as they make a decision to follow you, Lord, their lives will never be the same again. Lord, we ask that you bless them in all that they do. Bless them in their studies, in their work, in their relationships with their friends and their family. And that Lord, through them, many people will receive the blessing of coming to know you. That Lord, we speak over them that in all things they will know that they can do anything because you have given them that strength. They can commit 
They can change because you are with them. So we thank you for, for their lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's praise the Lord. And just do me a favor, turn around and follow Pastor Simon here. He's going to bring you to a room. We're going to spend some time with you over there at Suntech as well. And church, just thank the Lord for their lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I know we need to end the service, but I cannot end it without releasing a time of ministry and some of the words that have been released. This, at least this is what I prepared in my message. That today, some of us here, it's no coincidence you're at this service because the Lord just happens to be challenging you to sacrifice something, to lay down something. The Lord says today, come and lay it down. Remember, I said faith is letting go. Some of us, we hold on to things so tightly that we cannot let go. But if you cannot let go of something, you know you're not actually holding on to it. It is holding on to you. So today, come and let go of that. Sacrifice it. Lay it down. Following Jesus requires change. Some of us, we know areas that we need to change, but we refuse. We've heard it from our spiritual leaders. The Lord has told us that certain areas we must change. Maybe the things we're doing in work, the things we're doing in school. Maybe we have, Maybe it's, it's not even a matter of of that, that, oh, you're telling lies or whatever, but maybe you're doing something that's, that's just wrong in the workplace or in the family. Today, the Lord says, come and make that decision to change. It might be scary, it might be painful, but that's why you need to receive the strength of the Lord to get through it. And this is a word that I have, um, that I wrote down, and last night, the intercessor had the same word, and I know it's a word from the Lord. The Lord says He wants to bring about reconciliation in broken relationships within family dysfunctional families, especially between children and parents or parents and children. Just now when I talked about that, that unconditional love from a parent to a child, some of us, we felt something stirring up inside of us. Maybe we're the children who are struggling in this area. Some of us, our parents who are struggling in this area. Today, the Lord says, why don't you come? Follow me. You know, sometimes we always keep thinking, some of us are doing the same thing. Say, Lord, settle my family, then I'll follow you. No, today, what, maybe the thing is that you need to follow Him and you're going to find that change. You're going to find that strength to bring about reconciliation in, in your family. Some of the other words here, the Lord says, uh, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Some of us, we need to apply this in our workplace or in our schools. There's someone here, you have an injury or a problem with your right eye, the Lord wants to bring about healing. There's someone here, you need to stop worrying, but the Lord says, seek first His kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And there's someone here, you're, you're in your... You're, in your late 40s and you've been recently retrenched and you're full of anxiety the Lord says cast your cares on the Lord and He will sustain if you're being ministered to just continue just allow the Lord to do that deep work in your life right now but for the rest of us here and over there in Suntech lift up your hands I declare this over your life right now that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength that yes following Jesus it requires commitment, it requires change. Sometimes it can feel scary, sometimes it can feel difficult. But today I speak the strength of the Lord upon you, that we will follow Jesus all the days of our lives. I pray that we will be a community of disciples where we will be known by our fruit, that the world will look at us and say, Jesus Christ lives in them because it's no longer we who live but Christ that lives in us. So I set you apart and today as you follow Jesus, your lives will continue to be transformed that each and every day you become more and more like Christ. So I set you apart and that this week you will even leave this place being able to testify of how Jesus Christ has changed your life. So I set you apart. I speak this over you. We declare this in Jesus' most mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. You're dismissed. If you need to be prayed for, please let that ministry take place. The rest of us at TC, just quickly exit so that we can prepare the auditorium for the next service. But if you need to be prayed for, let the Lord work in your life right now. God bless you.